changing clothes in a hotel lobby, opening up for Back to Basics knowing this is more than just a hobby, touring 17 dates in 21 days with daily bus rides, nursing cramp legs. This is life on the road. Assessing limitations and pushing parameters. Busking with strangers who see more than just amateurs. We touch fame in this veritable endeavour. Showing just us, honest and laid bare. Bringing music back to its simplest form. Three artists who came together and left their comfort zone. An independent odyssey into the unknown. This is living. This is life on the road. Ian Brennan, famous, North County Dublin. Barry J. Hughes, Carrick Macross, County Monaghan. Brett Clifford, Agent Court, Dublin. The tour consisted of 17 shows over 21 days. and It was a full DIY aesthetic and approach. No manager, no hierarchy, so we built the whole thing ourselves. Uh, the tour was it was all self-booked by, by the three of us and promoted by the three of us and, and planned and put together and financed as well. I always had the idea in my head that I wanted to do a tour of Ireland um, but I wouldn't have the, the capability on my own at the level I thought I was at or like I don't have the contacts outside of Dublin and I've always wanted to play outside of Dublin. I felt I, felt I kind of I've done the circuit in Dublin a number of times now and I've played the open mics and, and, and they're great for people who are trying new songs and stuff like that and they really are great. But I suppose I want to experience what it was like down the country or, or up north or everywhere else and, and it's very different. Well Ian conceived the idea for the tour. I think he was quite keen to gig around the country, something he hadn't done before and he realised that uh, he could be he could extend his reach with, with two other musicians, so that was the idea. I've known Ian for a while, so he approached me and, and when he did, I jumped in without a moment's of hesitation because I needed a new project and a, and a new challenge. I played the 96 Over One Festival in Cork and I met Barry J. Hughes and we hit it off and we great cracked that night. And I, I asked Barry to be on the tour and I said, before I'd even asked Greg, I said, there's another guy doing it, Greg Clifford. <laughs> and I said, look, Greg's a great guy, and, and Barry was all on board. Yeah, when Ian approached me with the idea of doing a tour, he, he kind of mentioned that, you know, it perhaps hadn't been done before, and, and we, we still reckon it, it, hadn't, it hasn't been done before. Three, obviously people have toured the country, and they've done maybe anywhere between five and whatever amount of dates, but three solo independent acts, which is very important to mention that none of us are signed. We don't work with a record label. Uh, we, we work for ourselves. We're, we're independent solo musicians. We all kind of had responsibilities to do when we pick certain locations where we would book and we shared the responsibilities well. Um, it was very difficult at the time. I was, I was working full time and um, it, it was quite hard and the, the challenge was was huge and I had a lot on my plate going on and different things in my life but it was a really great experience to discover how much hard work that you need to put into to do something as big as this. Yeah, there's a, a lot of work goes into bringing this to fruition. We, we, we met months before the actual tour began. We had to go through the, the booking, the, all the logistics, the travelling, the, the accommodation, uh, the graphic design work booking radio, getting on blogs, but we, we divvied out the responsibilities and became quite a proficient unit. Daily communicating and, and messaging and phone calls to each other and then dealing with bookers and promoters and venues. I did mention it in a radio interview somewhere along the way that I, I was kind of put out of my comfort zone a little bit, but I hadn't thought about that, so it was kind of good for me that I didn't think too much about it and I, I just went for it and I, I said I wanted to be involved. It was very interesting for me because because I was so used to working on my own, I have my own routine, I travel everywhere on my own, so it was, uh, it was quite challenging for me actually. 
but um, the hard work that goes in, I mean, between contacting the venues, getting posters made, marketing, PR, radio stations, media, social media, there is literally months of work to be involved in the prep on something as big as this. This project was the biggest project I've been involved in, and I've played in numerous bands throughout the years, and we have never touched on anything as big as this. I suppose being an unsigned independent act in Ireland can be uh, quite tough, very rewarding at times, uh, that's important to note, but it can be quite a struggle. Um, you're trying to mix recording, gigging, writing and promoting and, and running your many, many social media platforms, which is a big part of it nowadays, and, and all the admin work then behind all of the above. When you're on your own, you don't have this kind of team of people behind you, so, you know, nepotism is rife. Um, but also, I think you have to consider the, the age, you know, in which the music is being made, the cultural context, and that is one of clutter and convenience, and people expect music to be free, you know, free entertainment, and this is the entertainment industry, you know. So, if you consider something like Spotify, you know, I, I'm only going to make 40 quid a year on that for an album that costs me three grand. So, monetary gain is almost non-existent, but I suppose you have to keep, you have to soldier on, you got to give up your soldier on, and for the moment I'm choosing the latter. Before the tour started, um, I was the kind of person that I had to have everything, kind of, I had to know what I was jumping into before I jumped into anything. So, on the tour, the freedom of, of, of and, and it was the first time I can actually recall living. It's quite liberating to play gigs, it's liberating to do a tour and be on the road. It kind of provides a sense of departure and escapism. Um, I also think some bands and acts are guilty of not gigging around the country enough to kind of leave, to exclude a few counties. Um, and people have a want, and there's, there's still a relevance and a need for live music, so I think there's some kind of duty to bring it to people. I think the Back to Basics name suited what we were doing um, because it was just, for the most part, it was three solo artists with their guitar bringing our music back to its simplest form, you know, just, um, just kind of delivering it with the raw intensity and, and passion that we have for our music and delivering it quite well, I reckon. In the build-up to the tour, we received good features in newspapers and on blogs and um, we had live radio sessions as well and yeah people were quite encouraging it was well received I think people found the concept of the tour quite endearing and that it was three independent musicians coming together to become this kind of collective force and in this industry we are kind of underdogs as such and people seem to have an innate fondness for the underdog I think for the most part we got on very well there was as there will be in any situation, especially a musical environment, there might have been a few moments where one, or one of us might be tired or whatever, so we had that support network within the three of us to pick each other up. We were quite mindful of each other. Also the fact that we're not a band, egos didn't exist. You know, it was just a short term, it was quite, you know, it was a transient kind of period. We came together, we created something, and then we were able to move on gracefully without falling out. All together we had 17 shows over 21 days of touring or it was it was chaotic it was messy it was complicated but it was the best experience i think i've had in the musical journey so far the tour aesthetic i guess it was it was all about recognizing our limitations and our boundaries and but how to push them how to not get cynical how to not wait for things to come your way in this industry because the music industry, it's pretty elusive. People grow cynical, but you have to be proactive and you have to move on. You have to create a, create a vision, have a goal, and see it through. You know, we've got one life, and I think you have to go out and live it. We've got to be proactive.
I was always surrounded by music at a young age. Um, you know, my, my dad was in a band, editor of a music magazine. Touring bands would sometimes stay in the house. So, yeah, it was an interesting house to grow up in, and it was a cool dynamic, very artistic. And my creativity was always encouraged and always fostered. So, I owe my folks a lot. But this is the earliest recording I have of myself. I recorded it when I was seven with a primary school friend of mine. We're called the, the Blue Lemons. Should we have a listen? From an early age I was always drawn to the Beatles. I was full on captivated by the melodies, the instrumentation. They were just so prolific and transcended many different styles. Their revolutionary impact on music in terms of timbre, artworks, uh, recording techniques, it simply can't be overstated. I was also into the virtuosic guitar playing of Jimi Hendrix, the electronic Germanic kind of sound of the likes of Kraftwerk, the Manchester scene, the likes of the Rolling Stones, the compositions of Brian Wilson, and uh, yeah, the list goes on. Aside from music, I would say the, the writing of Charles Bukowski, Andre S. Thompson, Albert Camus, uh, I find it's important. In fact, actually, I get influenced by, by reading I'm watching films more than I really do music. Uh, the filmmaker Werner Herzog and his unique approach and his drive, that, that really inspires me. Yeah, I've, I've always studied music, I've always been immersed in music. Like I, uh, I got classical guitar tuition and then I went on and studied classical music in college. Um, I graduated with a master's in contemporary composition. I've been involved in a lot of projects over the years. Like I've been a session musician an arranger. I've gigged with a, a classical guitar orchestra around Europe. Um, I gigged with a, you know, I was a drummer with a trad rock band for a while. So music kind of is my life, you know, I'm kind of completely consumed by it. Yeah, I played with a band called Elevator for six years. We were active between 2006 to 2012. Yeah, we were um, a three-piece rock band, kind of brick pop influence as well. We, we, we did quite well in the Dublin gigging scene. Um, we get strong numbers at the shows. I really enjoyed gigging with the band. It was really raw, sweaty kind of shows and energy. Uh, I'd be letting off fire extinguishers and smashing my Gibson up against the AC30. Got barred from a few venues along the way as well. So it was good fun. It was like a real apprenticeship into music and rock and roll. Um, yeah, we brought, brought out a few albums, a few EPs, and yeah, we, it, was quite, it, was, it was a great time. Yeah, eventually the band began to stagnate. There was kind of contrasting levels of interest and commitment. We weren't practicing enough. Um, I felt we weren't pushing our sound. We weren't challenging ourselves enough. I wasn't feeling stimulated. So that was, you know, it's difficult to let go. It's like a relationship. That you, know, it's, you know it's not good for you, but you've invested so much, so you're, you're desperate to cling on to it. But um, ultimately, ultimately, I think it was sort of best that I, you know, I walked away as such. Uh, yeah, when the band ended, I yeah, I kind of became a singer-songwriter, I guess, by circumstance. 
it's not a, a genre that I particularly love. It's not even a classification that I, that I like. I like to think of myself as a musician. But um, yeah, it was kind of a strange period. I was kind of lost a little bit of a period of transition and uncertainty. I felt a little bit exposed. You know, it's kind of a lonely existence being a, a solo performer. Uh, you know, I miss that big sound, a big depth, a big wall of sound that Elevator used to create. Yeah, I found myself exposed a bit vocally, you know, before I'd, I'd hid behind that large sound. Now I was exposed and I was like, geez, I've got a lot of work to do here. You know, I felt I had some kind of potential to be a decent singer, but I certainly had to get stuck in and, and, and find that kind of voice. Uh, from an early age I was always um, encouraged to sing and perform for say family or visitors that would come around to the house so that was there was always a bit of a, a persuasive element uh, from mum and dad there to to be a performer which is really what I wanted to do but I did need to be kind of encouraged from a young age and then as I grew older into my teens I was I was brought to a lot of shows a lot of concerts and I was always enthralled in the, the physical and visual element of a performance. If it was a, a musical or a theatre show or a band, I was always drawn towards the drummer. The, I, I was massively into the percussion end of things. Um, and then I actually got a drum kit from Santi one year. Come to the gate, you come to every so I started getting piano lessons from the age of around five, I think, shortly after I started primary school. I picked up guitar when I was maybe 10. My eldest brother Keith was showing me um, Nirvana parts in the guitar and uh, trying to get me to play Metallica riffs and stuff like that. And then I started getting lessons from my old uh, maths teacher in secondary school. Growing up in Monaghan, at the time when I was a teenager, I don't think I don't think there was much um, going on in the original music scene, and I'm not too sure now. Is it because I'm so immersed in it over the last few years that that I've discovered that there is actually a very strong original music scene in Monaghan, and there's a lot of really good people doing a really a, a lot of really good things for for the arts and performance arts uh, within Carton Cross. It's really cool. A lot of my growing up in Monaghan has come through in some of my lyrics for, for certain songs. Judgment Day being the main one where I was kind of perhaps picked on at school for being being that wee bit different and you know being I'm not saying it's because I was a musician but I, I just felt I you know I just was a, a little bit different from everybody else. I still do. <laughs> But uh, yeah, Judgment Day kind of talks a lot about that, but here I am now doing what I want to do. Uh, 
Uh, I enjoy taking inspiration from kind of places I visit, uh, especially if it's if it's anyways picturesque or if I'm attracted to the place. I do try and, and take time to sit down if it's on a beach or beside a lake or particularly old buildings, old derelict buildings. I, I, like, I don't know necessarily if it comes across in my lyrics, but it's there somewhere in me that I'm, I'm always attracted to, to the visual rather than writing about my thoughts, stuff like that. It, it, it comes across then in other lyrics. A, a song I wrote called Medieval City is about the castle in Kilkenny. I, I just love kind of the, the majestic nature of some of these buildings and how powerful they can be. And, and we're kind of, we're just such a small being beside some of these places. I describe myself um, quite contemporary and um, very melodic, easy to listen to, but the songs I write, they're very personal songs, so it's kind of, um, I couldn't just sit down to write a song, I'd have to experience something or, or hear a story from somebody and, and it would have to really come from the heart and really come everything I say, I mean everything I say. Growing up, um, my biggest influence would have been um, Kelly John from Stereophonics and Noel Gallagher from Oasis. The sheer simplicity of it, and just stuff that they, they, they kind of write about. So, like Kelly Jones literally just sat at a fruit and veg market where he worked and took in everything that went on around him. I thought it was great. Rumours that went around the town, and, and, and I think he got into a bit of trouble for writing the first album as well a little bit. But, um, and with the Oasis, it was just so simple and so effective. It was, it was brilliant. Growing up in, in Finglas, and with my dad coming from town, and that's kind of shaped who I am as a person. As a writer, it definitely has. In Can We Let It Go, I it's literally wrote about what we used to do as kids. So, playing football, annoying the neighbours, pebble dashing the windows, knickknacks, you know what I mean? Like, stuff like that. And, and, and it's great, you know, because, I don't know, the kids nowadays are stuck in their iPads, aren't they? Like, what are they gonna write about in the future, you know? Now the days seem to come and go 
this time can we let it go now the day seems to come and go so my music flows through my blood so my granddad plays um, he's playing since he's a kid his brother played um, I don't know if any of his other brothers played but, or his sisters but um, my two uncles played um, more or less all my aunts and uncles can sing or play some sort of musical talent so I kind of pass on through generation through generation just pick it up and, and I used to be uh, quite devious by just turning the machine heads without knowing what they were in my uncle's house <laughs> and my granddad's house while the guitars were lying around The great thing about you about you is to get out the trees have a different uh, how would you say different music tendencies yeah. you know it's a kind of different type of music like yeah. you, you like you, you you're on stage and the other two are the same we thought you were the same and all of a sudden you're looking up and saying this is completely different i'm sure the audience were the same way well that was one thing we had because the three of us were were so different um but not a million miles away at the same time yeah there is kind of there is similarities there, but but they are totally, we are totally different artists. But but it was great because and that's why the show was such a success. But a show that getting us the three guys that got so close mm. during that tour has become it seems like become great great friends. You could see it. It was like a magic between three us. It was a great thing to see because any other, I, I imagine you at the end of three weeks together, one is turning against the other. Normally that's where you were, but you seem to get on so well. You seem to have this. I think is that you is 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 have adopted a, that you have a friendship now that go on for a long, long time. Who who actually come up with the idea? Oh, you come up with the idea. Very good idea. That's why I'm so proud of you. He's like, <laughs> I'll come like this. Take out the granddads. <laughs> You're going places, you're going the right, you're going the right road. That's basically what I think, you're going the right road. And I certainly hope you get there. But whether you're doing that, I'm very proud of what you've done so far. And I hope the goal that you want, that you'll reach that goal. In my lifetime. <laughs> yeah. Thank That's the best I can do. So we were kind of thinking on the night, as is the first night, everything's up in the air, stuff running through my mind. Are we actually prepared for this? Am I, personally, am I prepared for this? Is there something we forgot? Could we put a bit more work in here? Could we do more promotion? They have a great appreciation for the original music scene in Slayer, and um, they're always very receptive to, it, to what's going on on stage. So yeah, it was good. Till
Ziel. Gigging on the unsigned independent scene, it's kind of a mixed bag. You, you never know what's going to present itself on the night, especially in this country. Different energy off the venue, different kind of crowd. I didn't know what to expect when I got to the hub, but I'm always nervous when I get to a new venue anyway, even when I'm doing my own gigs, because if you haven't been there before, you're kind of, you're apprehensive. It's great, you know, when you're, when you're gigging, it shows up a different different test or a different obstacle every night and you've got to respond to your environment and you know, it's the, the measure of a good performer or a good musician. Pass Hawk. How are we doing now, hey? That's <laughs> just sleeping. Yeah. So you have a good few dates. Um, you're playing the Secret Garden Cafe in Galway. Uh, you have Monroe's on the 24th, and that's supposed to be a big one, I heard. Uh, loads of yeah, people, there's great really interest nice. in it. Yeah. People are talking about it. Galway was good. We did two gigs in Galway with two very, very different approaches to Galway, and it, it was really the first time we set out on the road. What was quite palpable during the, the Galway part of the tour was that the three of us, you know, three individuals, really became a collective. The bond, the friendship grew closer. We were really all pushing, all driving in the one direction helping the show become stronger and I think we endeared ourselves further to the public and to the people who were attending the gigs. That was the first time I busked and in typical Barry J style if it's the first time doing anything I'm just you know really nervous about it. It's just busking is, is a totally different realm anyway because your audience is like changing by the by the second and I suppose the whole purpose of being out there that day was to stir up uh, support for the Monroe's gig which we did, we did a flyer um, promo and stuff like that. We've got a lot of uh, coverage in local press and uh, blogs and stuff. So we made a big push for Monroe's, as you would, because it's a, you know, it's a well-known venue.
I had previously played JJ Harless prior to the tour, so I was keen to add this one to a list of dates. What's prevalent here is that the crowd are true music people, they're not a passive audience. Their enthusiasm kind of permeates the whole night and experience and invigorates the performance. Bray was good. It was pretty. Uh, it was probably one of the more relaxed nights we had during the tour. Yeah, it's it's a beautiful venue, and again, like I think with a lot of the gigs, we arrived early, so we got to chill out and have chats beforehand. It was it was all good. So we've put this tour together as three independent Irish artists, and uh, we're delighted to be here in Bray in the Harbour Bar. And thanks for being a great audience. <laughs> As the gig unfolded, I noticed that I began to improvise a little bit more. I, sen I sensed that I had momentum and I, I began to really get comfortable with my songs and the set and how I was presenting them to people. And I kind of, I felt myself get lost in the music a bit that night, which was a cool sensation. There was a real natural chemistry at play between the three of us. It's not always easy to find that kind of alignment, three different characters three different styles, uh, but there was like a, an underlying cohesion, both musically and, and as people. I'm not going to even be in this, I'd say. In that square, you know. 
That's another swallow of a man. One here for you, that's yours. Oh, I got the septic one. <laughs> <laughs> I got a picture of Ian. <laughs> Ian and septic. <laughs> that was a great idea, wasn't it? <laughs> but yeah, we were about 15 euro down, but yeah, it was a good idea. <laughs> yeah. I pushed to add in an extra date when the dates were released and I kind of wanted to get somewhere in the Midlands. There was a bit of a come down feel to Port Leash. We'd expended a lot of energy in the previous dates, so we landed here and it was pretty much a ghost town. No fault of the venue, just in hindsight we shouldn't have played midweek. These things are going to happen though during the tour. You know, we're just a team of three people. I really enjoyed Belfast. Um, as a venue, it was it was nice to play in a huge open space. The sound really travelled well. It was it was really good. A, a bonus of doing the society sessions is they have a resident caricaturist who just kind of lounges around there in front of the stage as you're doing your set he uh, he sketches out what he sees and he adds in your your song titles around the sketch and has a chat with you after yeah it's quality isn't it yeah. It's really good to have you guys here, boys. Um, so Sally says it's had two of you here individually, and uh, Greg is the first time. Really good idea, and really good show, guys. Thanks very much for, for coming up. You guys are pretty awesome. <laughs> Nice one. Good to see Thanks. you again. <laughs> I think you guys all got left. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless I go for a bubble. Yeah. 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 It's not that funny. No, no. Oh, 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 no.
But I hope you don't understand, Lord, I hope you don't understand That I'll let you walk behind, that's a means to an end You're a long road straight, and I will be back, I will be back again Oh, a long road straight, and I will be back, I will be back again Oh, cause then I fear the unwell to you, my friend I give you all the love that I can send You're a long road straight, and I will be back, I will be back again and I know that I will see you again oh. In 2014 I kind of realised I needed to get away I needed to be anonymous I needed to find I needed to find myself a little bit as a performer and as a person So moving to Berlin was certainly a seminal moment Maybe it's not just Berlin. At that stage, I needed to be somewhere new. I, I needed to get away from this country. Uh, but, but not even just from this country, I needed to get away from my own routine. And, and it was part of that transition period uh, when Elevator had, had ended. Um, there was a lot of self-deprecation. I, I didn't really believe in the music I was writing. So it just wasn't in a great place. But that was the platform then to go, right, I've got to be, I've got to do something about this. I was kind of pragmatic with myself and honest and said, well, I need to go, I need to go somewhere. Berlin is a cheap city to live in, um, very artistic, uh, vibrant city, and that seemed like the perfect backdrop, and it turned out it was. It's just such a wonderful city, so vibrant, steeped in history, Cool abandoned sites. I mean, it's not all that long since the, the wall came down, so that's kind of kind of palpable. You, you feel that there's a real sense of reunification, people either respecting each other or just ignoring each other. Which is either way, I'm cool with that. Um, very artistic, lots of places to play, lots of different styles of music, and yeah, overall, I just found it really conducive to creating music and exploring uh, exploring a new sound. Prior to moving, I was kind of in a routine, or especially when you're when you're working, you know, when you're trying to balance writing and then doing orthodox work. Over there, I just was a full-time uh, musician, and and that was a big thing for me as well to just disappear, completely immersing myself in the creation, asking the songs the questions that you just can't do when you're you're part-time with it, and and the hours are sporadic. Over there, I was just completely focused. musicians along the way. I did a few collaborations with Elder Roach, um, an interesting guy that we, got, we really hit it off. Yeah, any venue that I went to uh, kind of responded to me quite well. I'm very, very encouraging. I met this whole kind of network of people over there. I wasn't expecting to. But I played, played a lot of venues, a lot of open mics and cafes and yeah, it was cool to test the new material that I've been writing. I, I, I'd never gone over there to, to set up indefinitely. I can't speak German and I was ignorant. I, I didn't try to, to learn. I was over there to write music um, and live cheaply and just try something different. Um, it's not a great scene for singers and, and an acoustic guitar, so I, I, I wasn't going to uh, make inroads into the, the market over there but the way that I potentially could do here or maybe uh, in England. Largely the material for Quadlibet was written in Berlin. You know, that was a really, really seminal moment in my life, important. It was important to get away and to delve beneath the surface, you know. For a long time, I had just kind of scratched around and tried different styles, but, but over in Berlin, I, I really focused, I really I felt that I was honing my craft over there. Quadlibet was recorded in London in a studio called Music Lands with uh, Ian Flynn as the engineer. 
we've done a lot of good work together. Um, he's a guy I really trust and yeah, with strong rapport and this kind of unified vision for the sound. So after 10 days recording the album, this kind of intensive period with a lot of previous pre-production put in place, I took a deliberate break. I wanted to, uh, I just wanted to listen to different music and uh, just come back then with cleansed ears and a kind of, uh, yeah, a kind of a cleansed perception. And yeah, having taken that three month break, I started adding in new parts that kind of, that kind of improved as a producer. And I think that benefited the album overall. I left a full-time job and, important to note, uh, a weekly salary to become a full-time musician. That came about um, because as much as I loved that job, I was finding myself being drawn to wanting something else in life. I, actually, I was approaching the age of 30. I don't really know if that's significant, but... I was really asking myself, am I going to be a restaurant manager for the rest of my life or am I going to do something with the music that I have been doing since the age of five and it, it all has to, it has to be leading somewhere, that's what I thought. Yeah, the, the job in the, in the restaurant and in, in the hotels and, and at bars that I worked in definitely stood to me because I was dealing with people on a daily basis or five days a week. That has stood to me because I'm, I'm a confident, outgoing person. And that's because of, of that job that I started when I was 17 and worked right through until I was 29 or 30. I thrive on the fact that I can meet new people and connect with, with the audience during a gig and after a gig. And beforehand as well, you know, you're meeting people. I'm, I'm, I'm still dealing with the public, but just in a different way and in a very more relaxed and exciting way, I reckon. The audiences keep me uh, kind of motivated and, you know, I'm constantly thinking of how, how I can create a different show or, you know, if, if I pass, if I pass, a, like this is going back to the, the, my, my love for derelict buildings and how can I get people to that space and, it might never have happened before, but can I be the one that might achieve that? Um, and I've, I've done that in certain venues around my hometown. Um, I've actually done it here as well. Uh, so that, that's really, really cool. There have been some really tough times where I've kind of sat back and gone, right, is this, did I do the right thing? But I think leaving the, the stability of a job to walk into the, the uncertainty, if you like, was kind of, I got, I got a certain buzz off that, you know? And I still do, that I don't really know what's, I don't have a five-year plan, I don't do that. My mentality is to, to, to work hard at what you do and, and eventually, It'll pay off, hopefully. <laughs> when I was growing up, um, 
there wasn't really much to do. To have a place like this was great because if you wanted a game of pool, you could come in and have a game of pool or foosball or whatever you wanted, basketball and that. It was great, you know, but especially playing music because there just is nowhere to go for kids to play music, you know what I mean? Like, and it was great here and they pushed you and they encouraged you. And they brought people in to help and you make new friends all the time when you're here and I suppose it does bring the community very close together. We used to be in here quite a long time trying to write songs or, or, or learn cover songs or we used to throw gigs on every so often in the hall or in the dropping area in the front and every Halloween at the back end. We would be rehearsing for months or weeks in here beforehand. Just trying to get it right, but we could never get it to sound right. That was... Yeah, a lot of good memories in here. Miss playing the, the, the guitar solos we used to play and I miss kind of um, having the pedals in front of me and, and, and kind of finding different sounds at gigs and yeah I, I do miss, I miss the power and the energy you could create with a band, it's totally different the energy you could create solo. How I deal with things is through music, it's a drug, it's not something, it's a drug I like, it's not something I ever want to, to, to get away from. I love surrounding myself with it. It's, it's just a part of who I am. I'm sure it's a part of who Greg is, and it's a part of who Barry is, and it's just a, it, I feel it's one thing you just, you have to have in your life. What are you really looking for? Someone to love or to adore? I guess this <laughs> That's why I don't. I wouldn't even try. I'm fucking brutal at all that. Yeah, how would you know you didn't try? I used to try as a child. Yeah, but you're older now, aren't Someday I try to reunite all the pieces that I lost, all the pieces that I may find. I see the world for me and how it turns, and how it hurts, and how it hurts. I'm sure you heard it all before. I'm not the first who walked out the door. Home is where the power won't swing. Escape it is a mess, cause words cut deep. What up, you understand? What up, you understand? That I left you all behind as a means to an end. You're a long road straight, and I will be back, I will be back again. Ooh, 
along those way, and I will be back, I will be back again. Oh, is it fair? Skipper Cove with Tommy Roach in fourth. Charger walk on is making ground towards the inside track by Pivot Bridge. And then towards the outside is Charger. tonight in the Brew Bar on McCurtain Street, 9.30. Bit of footage, that's a rare space, bit of footage now. Oh, really? Uh, so, uh, yeah. so you're back to basics, obviously. Uh, yeah, it's three independent acts, like what's three the name of the, What's the name of the room? I just said... No, no, <laughs> yeah. no the, the idea of this is... He, he is playing first, uh, oh, okay. Barry's on second, and I'm on third. No, I do not sorry, I thought you were third. I don't know you. <laughs> so there's three different acts, three solo acts, and the okay. tour, the collective tour name is called the Back to Basics Tour. Okay, so I don't grab it because they were born and they got a pornographic disease. <laughs> but nobody fucking cares. You know what I mean? I used to wear the phone joke to the Good night. Hello there. Good night. Hello there. I like the deep looks on your faces, by the way. Yeah, the deep intense. They're ostrays. I years. I worked a lot on TV shows and interview people fucking all the time. venue called the Courthouse Restaurant. Well, it's predominantly a restaurant. Uh, I think the only gigs that have taken place there are mine. So um, I, I knew that would be the perfect spot for, for us to visit. 
I know Barry was a little bit anxious and apprehensive in the build up to the gig. I feel he put a bit of pressure on himself as he was the one kind of hosting the event and he wanted us to enjoy the town and be well received. But he also wanted his hometown people to be proud of him and his efforts. And that's all testament to the kind of person Barry is. I have brought two very good friends of mine with me this time. Uh, Greg Clifford, who is about to take to the stage, and Ian M. Brennan, who you'll hear later on. And the three of us uh, are collectively known as the Back to Basics Tour. We don't want to hurt in the world Too much hatred you found Let's all stop playing games I walk the streets of my own so so tranquil alone Oh yes, I'm happy now Because tonight I'm looking out for number one Lay it down for the world to see Don't be so Lay it down for the world to see Wear your heart on your sleeve hey! oh, 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 oh Guide me it was a good moment for me to welcome the guys and, and introduce them to my family, introduce them to my followers and fans and character. Yeah, it was really, it was a really good night. Come to the gate that you come to every year Keep in his hand and you're, you're clutching the near to you Walk to the edge, to the edge We are delighted to have them in the studio with us this morning to give you a taster of what you can expect. I'm just wondering though, I mean, you know, there is three of you coming together and doing a tour. I mean, it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that, you know, you couldn't, maybe a few more people get involved and you have your own little label. I mean, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's, there's room idea. to grow for sure. Yeah, mm. we had all yeah. sorts of ideas from the start though. We kind of said, look, if this happens again, like if, if enough people took more notice, could end up being a festival, could end up being yeah. a, a, a... Well, we're shooting a documentary as well. Yeah, yeah. So that will come out later on, um, later in the year, or possibly at the start of next year. Depends on the editing time, you know. It's quite an undertaking. But, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of room for the Back to Basics notion and uh, concept to, to grow. Mm -hmm. So we'll see, we'll see. I just uh, want to get through to Sunday though, at the moment, do you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just again, uh, to let people know that it's on tonight in the Spirit Store. Uh, your doors are, which is at 8 o'clock or 8 o'clock-ish? Yeah, we're kicking off around 9 o'clock. Yeah. Then we had the college after that, 
we went into the college. I don't think we'd actually any business being in the college whatsoever, but... Yeah, we went to the college to kill a bit of time, and it turned out the student presidential elections were on. People were canvassing for votes. There was a PA set up. So we, we sensed an opportunity, and like mercenaries, aligned ourselves with their campaign and availed of the stage and the sound setup. stories just down there on the on the dock and it's, it's beautiful and it's I suppose if you're doing a tour and you're visiting that part of the country the spirit store is the place to be I can sing as well I play guitar yeah uh, yeah I mix with everybody I don't care I'm from the Paris so fuck it the Pacific if they can do it why not everybody else I do my own thing as well and everybody loves it too <laughs> I had a few people there that I knew, which was great. But Ken is like in if if people are coming to me asking, you know, where is good gig in Monaghan in Monaghan Town, McKenna's is the place to go. It's it's renowned for original music. Hey, 
Barry was like a man possessed that night. Really dynamic performance. He was like a caged animal who broke free, free of inhibition. Playing in Monaghan was kind of like the climax of the tour for him and all this pent up energy and he just channeled it into a really strong performance. In the build-up to the Dublin gig, Jeff, who was our resident back to basis tour poet, invited us into St. Alden's Primary School to put on a music workshop for his class. The school itself has strong core values in regards encouragement, appreciation and empathy, so of course we obliged. The kids were really excited by the prospects of us coming in, so we really felt privileged to be in such a position to put on an event like this. During the workshop we demonstrated the importance of rhythm and timing, and even the importance of letting yourself get lost in the music, getting lost in the excitement of it all. And we were really impressed by their level of interest and how engaged they were. We also introduced them to new instruments, ways of playing the instrument, different techniques, the importance of dynamics in music, antiphonal call and response singing, and we even touched on how to approach writing your own song. Sometimes as a musician, because we're so immersed in it all, we're constantly around it, the, the magic and the wonderment is kind of lost on us. But days like these, moments like these, make you realise and appreciate where you're at. It kind of puts it into a perspective. It's quite humbling really. Music at the core is cathartic and liberating, and hopefully we will have inspired some of the kids to further explore music in the future.
The Grand Social was the final show. It's a really renowned venue, so the night itself was kind of tinged with nervous energy, but, but mainly excitement. And we were really keen to present ourselves in a professional way, and I believe we achieved that. Smoke screens, a knowing frame, and then you're able to just... Where we are, where do we go from? Yeah, Dublin was good and I was kind of playing to a new audience so we had a lot of uh, Ian's family and friends and Greg's family and friends and like, I, like I'm based in Monaghan so gigging in Dublin for me to a new audience was great. And that, that was the whole point of the tour was to put three guys together and use our, our resources collectively and travel around and, and gain new followers individually, which we did. It worked, as it turned out. Thank you very much for coming out here tonight. This means the world to all of us for you to be here and to witness this. really encouraged by the large numbers that came to the show and this really reflected the genuine interest that we had built around the tour. Massively proud of the tour. I think we achieved something unique and something very special. I think we put it across to our followers and our fans in a really professional way considering we put it together ourselves. And I think the fact that we documented it and we're here today talking about it and wherever we are now watching this I think is really cool because it's that's always going to be there. It was mad to think of, of the workload that went in and, and I, I, I imagine the other lads are as well but I'm super proud of what we did and the achievement we set I don't believe this has been done before recent well at least recently anyway. Um, yeah when I look back on the tour it's difficult to measure success you know, sometimes it's even difficult to define what success is, it changes from person to person. But ultimately I believe it is something that was worthwhile. Uh, you know, we, we had a vision, we had a goal, and with hard work we brought it to fruition. So I mean, I suppose that has to be a success. The come down was really tough actually for me, uh, because I've made two really good friends in Greg and Ian, and as soon as the tour finished, but well we actually finished on the Saturday in, in the Grand Social in Dublin and then we did a more chilled out kind of after party gig in the Patriots Inn, Kilmain in Dublin. 
so it, you know we had the Sunday to kind of chill out and, and enjoy each other's company. So then I went home uh, on the Sunday night after the Kilmainham gig and then the Monday morning it was like well that's it the tour was over and it was just like just being dropped in, in a in a black hole like it was just really really hard for me it was incredible it was this best experience I had and if the lads asked me to go again in the morning I'd go 100% I don't think I'd be I'd be game for uh, yeah I wouldn't be too fond of doing another self-funded tour or project you know it leaves you really void of energy it leaves you depleted of cash because all else becomes subservient in your life in that, when you're involved in a tour like this with a month's planning you know you, you give yourself over to it completely so I think I'd need some kind of team or some kind of management or backing to, uh, to take on such a project again I do from time to time kind of have a fear of what's what's going to happen down the line uh, you know with even when it comes to you know a pension or retirement fund there's none of that there for me at the minute so like if I were to if I chose at some stage to have a family or have a partner or whatever like I don't know can I support that family or you know because there's a there's a serious amount of uncertainty in what I do yeah I mean I'm always going to create I don't expect to to make it as such in this industry um, and I've kind of made my peace with that you know I, I, I know the sacrifices along the way but uh, I'm kind of comfortable with that now so I, I just want to keep throwing myself into the realm of possibility and collaborate with people and living my life through music trying yeah that's it just, just trying new things all the time It was challenging, it was tough, they definitely hadn't done something like this before and, and stamina levels had to be sharp, but it was it was great and the memories I'm going to cherish and have for the rest of my life. I think when you're playing 17 or 18 gigs over that, that small period of time, you do develop as a musician, your stamina has to develop, it's not even about the performance, but the musician as, as the person definitely develops because you might be going on stage after only a few hours of sleep and five hours of travelling and you still have to you still have to bring it and that's not even mentioning the beer or the, the gin and tonics On a personal level kind of an achievement I suppose would be it's rekindled my interest and lust for a live performance so that was quite exciting that, that's something that I definitely will take away from this talk I'm so busy now and surrounding myself by music and it's great but before the tour started it was never like that so one of the main things I picked up on the tour was just do it and just live it and and I did things on the tour that I haven't done before in my life and it was amazing it was amazing I definitely think the Back to Basics tour is something that other people should look at and take encouragement from in the knowledge that it can be done without the help of all the higher beings in the industry. That it can be done and you can get your music out there. Enjoy it. There is no certainty about the future or what lies ahead for me or probably for Ian or Greg either. Um, Back to Basics Tour was what it was. Uh, we created it and we're really happy with it. I don't know where I go from here, but I'm going to keep doing what I do. Out of the limitations and commitment emerged the Back to Basics tour. And while worthwhile, on an existential level, kind of plays itself out in a Sisyphean manner, the futility within this line of work is sometimes borderline absurd although we do recognize there is no divine right to succeed 
you know, we're, we're kind of just here providing, I suppose, a measured insight into the world of an unsigned musician. You can plan for the future, but you can't always depend on the outcome. And I guess what we can do is make the most of the moment, and once concluded, venture forward into the next project, equipped with new skills acquired and the experience of previous endeavours. Adversity 